If you just post something on a video to talk about something that's going on in business, that's fine. If you take a headline from your own article, you then take that article and you take it into a green screen on social and you talk over it. That format will get you three, four, five times more viewers. More the end. It's strategic, organic content. Joining me today is Gary Vaynerchuk, who is a serial entrepreneur and serves as the chairman of media conglomerate VaynerX, the CEO of media agency VaynerMedia, and a creator and CEO of NFT project VFriends. He's also the co-founder of Resi, which he sold to American Express in 2019, and is an angel investor to some companies you may have heard of, like Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat. You may have seen him as Gary V online, where he documents his life as a CEO on social media, where he has more than 44 million followers across various platforms. Gary, hi, welcome to Abu Dhabi. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for talking to me. So that was a lot in there. Media, social media, NFTs, just at the top. I want to talk to you about all of those things, but I kind of just want to get a sense of your thinking these days on the state of just consumer culture. Mm. The head of a media agency, consumer culture is your bread and butter. What are people wanting these days? I mean, there's so many things. I think our hypothesis, my hypothesis, has always been based on context and relevance over awareness um, for the sake of awareness, meaning, you know, you can know that Coca-Cola exists, but can Coca-Cola get you to care? And so when I think in Fortune 500 land, Starbucks, Nikes, BMW, I think a lot about this question from the context of consumers want relevance. You know, they want to see something from these brands that makes them feel something or consider them. At a small business and creator level, it's the same. We build our brands and our awareness from relevance. We're unable to run a Super Bowl commercial, so we have to win on the battle of putting out 40, 50 pieces of social media content a day across seven or eight different platforms. So that's what I think people are looking for. So to win, it involves prodigious output on free content if you're small, and on big companies, it's about relevance. But when you talk about output on social media, where are you seeing companies actually getting it wrong these days? You know, I would argue the bigger the company, the more wrong they are, right? <laughs> um, it just is- That's a hot take, all right, that's a, that's a headline. What are some examples that you're seeing? Well, I would tell you that, you know, again, to put into context for the listeners, VaynerX, VaynerMedia, my marketing company, we work globally, APAC, uh, Europe, LATAM, US. Um, we're, we're, we're recording here in the Middle East, not for kicks and giggles. We'll be here and we'll be in Africa and we'll be in Brazil and we'll be everywhere. And when I look at around the world, what happens is the bigger you are, the more you treat social media the way you treated television and billboards and print. And what's happening is it's just all vanilla and there's not enough output. So what are companies getting wrong? They don't have enough output. They don't live under the context of strategic content. They just post for the sake of posting. They don't factor in what is our religion, which is something we call PAC, platforms and culture. If you don't know that carousel ads are over-indexing right on a, right now on Instagram, you're not gonna post them. So if you don't know the platforms, the al- not just the algorithm that everybody likes to talk about, but even one's ability to take advantage of all the different creative formats, a green screen, right, in your line of work. If you just post something on a video to talk about something that's going on in business, that's fine. If you take a headline from your own article, you write an article, you then take that article and you take it into a green screen on social and you talk over it. I'm sure everybody who's listening right now, if they have social media, have seen a human talk over a green screen of an article. Mm -hmm. That format will get you three, four, five times more viewers. More the end. It's strategic, organic content, what we call SOC, is the biggest elephant in the room right now. So where do influencers play into this conversation? In terms of output and content, where is the content coming from? Well, to even add to that, I'll answer that, but where influencers are playing a role is that they're the ones who are more native to understanding the creative strategy. They have no choice. They they're don't the modern have... day copywriter, they're the modern day. They are. Where do they fit into the agency model? Uh, well, they, to me, they're competitive to the agency model. They're uh, additive to the agency model. They are the future agency owners. That's what I came from. I was making wine content. Today, we are going to visit the wonderful and interesting world of Pinot Grigio. And realize this actually scales for every business in the world. Let me start an agency. Media is literally, besides Widen and Kennedy, 
the largest global independent agency that's been created in the last 40 years. That came from a content creator. That's who I was. Yes, I was a retailer. Yes, I was an e-commerce retailer. But at the end of the day, the only reason I forayed into Madison Avenue was because I spent a half a decade winning on content and was realizing it was outperforming my print, radio, direct mail, and television advertising. And so how is content evolving? So when I was, I actually, my first job out of college was at an ad agency. Separate story. <laughs> but it was the time of native advertising, inbound marketing. Right. We were the HubSpot the, DNA. Yes, yes. We were an early client of HubSpot. Yes. And um, talking about just generating this co- death by content. Oh, awesome. Yes. Website, build as much articles, win SEO, have them come to you. So where are we now? The and social media Chat version GPT of that. GPT in the conversation. Whoa. Where is this? Where are we going? Well, that's a different thing, but to I'll, I'll answer both of those. Yeah. One, we are in the social media version of what the website version of inbound marketing was 15 years ago. So it is a volume game. Mm-hmm. But you know, you probably learned this at the time. I don't know how long you were there, but what people learned in writing SEO and articles was, yes, it'd be awesome if you wrote 50, but it'd be a heck of a lot better if you wrote 13 great ones than 50 bad ones. When I say make a lot of content, if you make 13 horrible pieces of social media content, there's only so much good that can come of that. It's better than one horrible piece of content, but the reality is you have to be good at it. As far as ChatGPT is, we are in the pre-dawn of scaled AI making a huge impact on copy and creative. I think for us personally at Vayner and me personally, the trademark and copyright aspect of all of this is a very big elephant in the room. And so we can't use it yet for our clients. If God forbid there's a lawsuit and the creative, can, you know, so we have to be careful. You can't about really that. cite your sources. We can't. We not, can't. That's not, not good. And, and what a lot of people in your line of work are worried about is it's an it's a new Google all over again, right? It's gonna index everything and take it for itself and not create any economics or cite any credit to the sources. This is a major, major hornet's nest that's gonna be figured out probably over the next five to 15 years. But the reality is the technology is not going back in the genie bottle. This is here and it will be here. I think it actually is gonna collide quite a bit with uh, decentralized servers. Yeah. I want to pump the brakes on decentralized for one second because I want to talk to you. The last time the National spoke to you, it was on NFTs. Yes. And it does feel like the shine, the bloom is off the rose on NFTs. South by Southwest was last week. Yes. uh, Talking tech and culture. Yes. NFTs weren't really mentioned. Meta just made headlines. They're shuttering their NFT efforts. Mm -hmm. V Friends is your effort in this space. Yes. What are you thinking? You know, I'm thinking what I thought nine months ago when I made 50 to 100 pieces of content that said 99% of these things are gonna go to zero because what happened was what happened with late 90s internet stocks. Then Then they were stocks, this time they were collectibles, but the same thing happened. Everyone got way too gold rushy, everybody cared about greed instead of building, and you had way too much hysteria, and so what you had was a scenario that was inevitable, which was the macro technology is profound. I'm more bullish on NFTs today than I was a year ago, but the individual projects that were built a year ago were built for short-term financial reasons, not for long-term reality. So for me, when I built VFriends almost two years ago, I'm like, I'm gonna build Pokemon meets Sesame Street and this is gonna take me the rest of my life. I think that that's a very different point of view on it. So that, that was my take. I think, The really interesting part is smart contract. I think decentralized servers that create providence are gonna become a very important element in an AI world. I think. I'm hearing your uh, your wine heritage meeting up with your. uh, It's true. Your blockchain. That's a very smart. Inheritance. That's a very smart uh, observation. The providence thing really matters. It's like vineyard source. It's, I learned a lot in the wine business that ironically impacts. In terms of creating value. A hundred percent. So value in the wine world is all about providence. It's all about the year, the timeliness. When you look at things like NFTs, you do think you can create value by being able to cite with the really strong fidelity where something comes from. Only if people want it. Only, yeah. Like what people don't understand is only 1% of comic books are sought after. 
Only 1% of sports cards are sought after. Only 1% of sneakers are sought after. So when humans collect, they only collect a very small subset of the overall genre. So art is no different than NFTs. Sports cards are no different than NFTs. Comics are no different than NFTs. The problem was last year, people clumped NFTs as all NFTs. Mm -hmm. That would be like saying every piece of art is gonna go up in value. Mm -hmm. Instead of just Jackson Pollock and Andy Warhol. Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I believe that NFTs are gonna be a collectible in perpetuity because I know how people collect. It's already clear, and by the way, in this huge winter that is so atrocity and like it's all over, there's enormity of collectible going on. Mm -hmm. There's an enormity of money being pushed. And by the way, SVP Bank goes down and look what happens. People take a step back and say, huh, maybe something that's decentralized that can't be you know, impacted is something I may want to look at. And so you know, I think there's still a lot of change and things to think through, but what happened? was super predictable and I'm not Monday morning quarterbacking at the height of it. In August and September, I went on a rampage to make sure that people were being thoughtful and unfortunately people are, real, you know, we're at a real estate conference right now. It happens in real estate, it happens on Wall Street, it happens in collectibles. When it's going good, people become delusional and greedy and that's just human nature. So you predict it will be durable. It, it's like, here to stay. A hundred percent. But Still again, the old, of course, the macro technology is profound. Mm -hmm. When everybody wrote articles that the internet was a fad in 2000 because all the stocks collapsed because they were overvalued by Wall Street, that didn't make the internet less important. It meant that Wall Street was greedy. Today, the same thing's happening with NFTs. So you like to dispense advice. So I want to ask you if you're to dispense advice now on the NFT chat GPT, metaverse, this kind of space of frontier technology, yes. and you're a small business owner, what moves, what, what are the smart moves right now in these spaces? Is it smart to move in these spaces just yet? As an SMB, probably not, other than education. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be very thoughtful with your monies when you're an SMB. And so first of all, it goes back to the first part of the conversation. What every small business on earth, from every corner of the earth, needs to figure out is a very smart, organic social media strategy. It is disproportionately the biggest impact on their bottom line when it comes to at least marketing and demand creation. As far as frontier tech, it's good to keep an eye on it. It's good to be ready. It's good to flirt with it. Education is very powerful, so I think people should know about it. But I think frontier tech is something that is incredibly high risk. More importantly, it's never at the scale that people want it to be, but it's important to pay attention and get your hands dirty in it so you are prepared. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think about, okay, uh, this Shoshana Zuboff book, Surveillance Capitalism, she kind of coined that term, this idea of the attention economy, the infinite scroll we kind of all find mm -hmm. ourselves in. You're a real creature of the infinite yes. scroll. You, you live and die yes. by, by that. How do you stay, I think, the other side of the coin on this social media economy that we've built is surveillance capitalism, is this kind of darker, more nefarious way of thinking about it and there are real privacy concerns and like societal implications i guess what i want to ask you is how do you stay motivated in that space do you ever have second thoughts on where we're headed i stay motivated because i'm incredibly optimistic on the human race i i think that you don't look at internet culture and think oh my gosh yikes you're a, you're a big celebrant of it I'm much more excited about it than what happened pre-internet culture. Mm. Like, you know, I think what's important is to understand what are we demonizing and what are we scared of? So to me, privacy is controllable. So like, if somebody's listening right now and they're like, I'm really, no way, Gary, you're so wrong. I'm like, delete the apps. Don't have an iPhone. Like, I love the concept of accountability. You like, can opt in or opt out, but it's becoming, decreasingly possible to opt out as you're making this I would, of I would actually argue the other way. Yeah. I think there's micro trends of people opting out more than ever. Yeah. I think it was harder seven years ago to opt out than today. I think mm -hmm. it's cooler to opt out now. I think people are leaning into knowing their options. And I think people are finding their calibration of balance. Like the amount of parents that like stop me in the middle of the street and say, TikTok, and I'm like, then delete it off your kid's phone. Like the lack of accountability and the lack of understanding how much control humans actually have, I think people have 
absolutely opted in to this depressive state that America or China or TikTok or Meta or Mark Zuckerberg controls them. I think it's a cop out. I think it's because accountability has come out of favor and I don't, I'm not worried about it at all. Not worried about it. Okay. So last question, dispensing advice to. Because others. can I, can I add one point? Yeah, please. It would be the same, co- you know, there was a, there's a couple other things I think a lot about. I think about America banning alcohol. They thought that that would solve the problem. Like to me, banning or stopping or being scared is never the problem. It's understanding how to use everything. A car is dangerous if you don't know how to use it. A Mm -hmm. bottle of gin is dangerous if you don't know how to use it. Sugar is dangerous if you don't know how to use it. I think we need education and conversation, but I think ultimately it's about accountability. Do you bear a responsibility to do more education on these things or is that a space somebody else should occupy? You know, I I think I do it all the time. I'm doing it right now with you. But my problem is that most people ride waves so hard that I'm doing it right now. I think when I'm answering, hey, have you ever considered accountability? I think I'm doing way more public service right now than saying we should ban this and we should ban that. This is a major pandemic of the last 30 years. The world has fallen in love with pointing fingers. It's your fault. You're media. It's my fault. I'm social media. Why are we not into thumbs? Well, my my question really was, how do you stay motivated in a landscape that's that's yelling at you and tell and pointing fingers? How do you stay? How do you get up every morning and kind of get back get back on the horse? Because I have no attachment to the validation and or the tearing down. See, one of the great things when you don't believe in your own headlines is you don't believe in the trolling either. When you are actually in a state of doing things for yourself and what makes you happy, not the addiction of the validation of the likes or the treachery of being torn down, you're in a much better place. I'm motivated because I'm detached. All right. A stoic, a stoic line to end on. I don't know if I believe you that you're detached. Well, I think that's only because you don't know me. Yeah. You know, and which I respect. It's one of the reasons I judge no one. I don't know them. Gary V, fun to talk to you. So much fun. You know, it's funny you, you, we end with that. It's been the biggest thing of like, how the, to your point, like how does one sustain when there's so much going on? Yeah. It's, you know, for me, it's um, that whole validation or detachment. It's kind of like my sports teams. I like love the process of a team winning a championship. Yeah. But once they do, I'm like out. <laughs> and so like when the Yankees and the Rangers won their championships, I stopped cheering for them. And I never understood it when I was a kid, but as I've gotten older, I'm like, ah, I like the process. Mm-hmm. You know, like the process is fun for me. The winning, the wins and the losses you need to feel. Yeah, I just, I just like, the, I like the trying yeah. more than like the outcome. Well, I mean, I asked you that question just because of what I cover. So I'm the future editor at The National, which means I cover chat GPT, yeah, 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 yeah. cover all of this. And I find it the more I find out about this stuff, the it's more, daunting. The, yeah, the more I'm like, I'm gonna go I get cover it. I get um, it. animals, you know, birds, yeah. in the jungle. <laughs> I think I think that I think I get that. What I will tell you, and this maybe will help you, but get less daunting, is like, go read the articles about things that seem mundane now. Go read what they said about the television. How it was yeah. gonna, how it was gonna be a zombie machine. Right. It will start to feel um, more charming and less sinister and nefarious. It's, it's, it's only because the, in the, we're in the moment now where people are demonizing technology. Yeah. You know, 10 years ago, when you were working at, like, that was the golden era. That was all good. Yeah. And now we're in the all bad, and the reality is it's always in the middle. Yeah. I don't know. I do think that the tools that we're using now are so much bigger and more sophisticated and are creating a feedback loop to, you know. But, but you'll appreciate this. Everything's a feedback loop. Vogue magazine was a feedback loop in 1987. Hmm. It was, you know, like I think I think that what we we struggle with is understanding that within context, everything is that. Like you know, yeah. everything is forming opinion. Walter Cronkite dictated what people thought at yeah. scale. Okay, I could, I could you, sort you see of, where I'm going. I can sort of buy that comparison. Like it's really interesting when you really like dig into this game. It's fascinating. Yeah, I just I don't know. I think it's capacity to manipulate. It's just kidding. But your mom was manipulating you before, right? Like, I get it. Like, okay, but like, 
we have always been manipulated by whatever we were consuming. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is it better that it's the world or is it just a small group of people? And that's always been the case. Yeah. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for being an inspiration. Thank you. Oh my gosh, these guys got like emotional when I yeah. started talking to you. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> humble. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers.